Hey there! Today I've got some really exciting news. Namely, there's a new construction grammar textbook that's about to come out with the Cambridge University Press. Uh, the book is called Construction Grammar, the Structure of English, written by my good friend Thomas Hoffmann. And when I saw that the book was about to come out, I thought that, yeah, I really needed to make a video about that. So in this video, I want to talk about that book. But it's actually going to be better than that because I asked Thomas if he would be willing to come on the channel so that I could ask him some questions about the book and he could let us know directly what the book is all about. So I wrote him an email and about five minutes later he wrote back and said, yeah, let's do this. Uh, he also sent me the book manuscript so that I could have a look. And yesterday we actually had the chance to sit down and talk. So the rest of this video is going to be the interview. I think you'll find it really interesting. And of course, I hope you'll enjoy it. Here we go. All right. So uh, I'm extremely thrilled to have a guest on the channel today. Uh, Thomas Hoffmann, a professor of English language and linguistics at the Catholic University Eichstätt Ingolstadt. Um, Thomas, you are the author of a uh, construction grammar textbook that has just come out. Um, we've known each other for quite some time. Uh, for those of you who don't know Thomas, so um, Thomas is a um, professor in Eichstätt. He has done a PhD at uh, the University of Regensburg. He's also been professor uh, at the University of Osnabrück. Uh, and you've also had a position, uh, or still have a position, in uh, China, right? Um, Thomas is the author of several uh, books. So, for example, his uh, 2011 book on uh, preposition placement in English. Um, then the 2013 Oxford Handbook of Construction Grammar uh, that he edited together with Graham Trousdale. Um, in 2019, uh, he published a book on comparative uh, correlative constructions in English. And uh, now the reason that we're meeting today is the uh, 2022 book uh, with the title Construction Grammar, uh, The Structure of English. So I, I can't really describe everything that uh, Thomas has been doing up to this point, but um, well, he's an expert in syntax. Uh, varieties of English, uh, corpus linguistic methodology, uh, but more recently also he has worked on linguistic creativity, on multimodality, so there's really a lot uh, going on. Thomas, it's, it's great to have you on the channel. Welcome. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for this very kind introduction, and it's great to see you again. Great to see you too. So, um, <clears throat> um, we're here to talk about your book. Uh, so, Let's jump right in and uh, please tell us a few things about the book. What is it about uh, and who is it for? Yeah, um, thank you for this opportunity. Well, the book is an introduction to construction grammar as a theory and what it can do when it comes to describing, as the subtitle says, the structure of English. So what was important for me was to write a book that students who would just taken a Linguistics 101 course, who are familiar with the basic concepts from phonology to syntax and social linguistics, um, could pick up and then would get like a very comprehensive overview of phenomena from English that would show them how a single cognitive theory can capture those phenomena. So that even though in the introductory course they might have got the idea that some of these fields are rather separate, that there might be a strand of research that's emerging, uh, that's emerging that sort of brings this together and that, like an umbrella theory, at least tries to account for all of these phenomena. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's quite interesting what you're saying there. So um, in a linguistics intro course, uh, students can have the impression that all the different things that they're learning about are pretty separate, but you're saying that they actually belong together, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, the kind of research that we've been doing uh, for more than a decade now, the, the two of us, you know, uh, we've looked at how language is shaped by usage, how cognitive principles, how domain general principles, like how humans think in terms of symbols, how humans interact as social beings, shapes their grammar, shapes their language, mm -hmm. um, and how this allows us to sort of say, okay, 
if this is how humans think and how language evolves, um, then maybe that can give us like a comprehensive narrative of language variation and change, of how humans interact, and how we can, even on a more abstract level, you know, take something really abstract like grammar and put it back into the social interactions that humans have and what they do with a grammar. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, construction grammar has been a part of your work uh, pretty much throughout uh, your career. So um, now you've written a book about construction grammar that introduces uh, this concept or this uh, theory uh, to uh, students. So why should students care uh, about construction grammar or what do you think is interesting about construction grammar uh, from a student perspective? I think, you know, if I was a student and I would look at that, what I would find interesting, and I already mentioned this, is that it gives you like a single theory that can account for language use and language structure. And very often when you, when you learn a language as a second language, or even if you, you, you want to teach your own language um, as a native speaker, um, you get all these rules and it all seems so abstract and it seems like a long list of things that don't really tie together. Mm -hmm. um, and what construction grammar does is, I think, as I said, provide a common narrative for you, for you to think about language as something that humans use to interact symbolically, to talk to each other, to exchange feelings. Um, and at the same time that this very basic idea that we talk through symbols um, doesn't just inform like the word level, but that you can use that to also think about more abstract grammatical concepts like tense, um, aspect constructions, um, all the way down to, as I said, language evolution, um, change and, and variation. So hopefully, you know, it's an appealing book for students who really want to have like a, a single theory behind this um, that is also applicable to language teaching and to many domains of social linguistics and diachronic change. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so many people who might be watching this uh, would have heard of construction grammar as uh, something like a competitor theory, a competing framework uh, that is opposed to generative linguistics or, or Chomskyan, uh, well, uh, universal grammar. Um, how do you see that? You mentioned Chomsky's work in your book. Um, how do you see that relation? I think Noam Chomsky, I mean, arguably still the most prominent and important linguist of our time. And his work has informed like many schools and even competing theories. Um, I think um, his 1965 book Aspects is still a very interesting read for anyone who starts out in linguistics. Um, and for a long time, I think it's fair to say that he was the dominant school within linguistics. But it also made assumptions which I think we can no longer uphold because of research that's been done in language acquisition. Uh, for example, as I point out in the book, I mean, one of the main arguments for Chomsky was to say there is a universal grammar. There is something that we're born with that's specific to language. It's a module. It doesn't interact with anything else. Um, and he claims that children need to have this to acquire a language because all children acquire language fairly fast and in similar sort of steps. Um, and he also said that kids do something, they say things they've never heard before. That was his famous argument against the behaviorists, um, that you're not parrots. You don't just say what your parents have said before, but you can go beyond this input. Um, but I mean, there have been empirical studies as well that have just shown that, you know, if we go beyond a simple behavioristic model, um, but if we include domain general knowledge, things that kids can do even outside of language, like form categories, knowing that this cat is another instance of a category of cats and they've seen many different ones, black ones, white ones or whatever, um, that these are general domain cognitive principles. And if you take these together with the social human beings that we are, um, I mean, Michael Tomasello has done a lot on this on language acquisition and on how social interaction 
and principles of joint attention, you know, from the start when parents are interacting with babies before the babies can even speak. You can see after six, seven months that there is joint attention. They'd be looking at the same thing and parents have a way of directing the attention of the kid to that object. So there's a lot going on in a, in a kid's brain, so to say, um, and language can uh, piggy bank on that and, and it can help kids sort of um, say things they've never said before because they can generalize, they can categorize, and they can build on that. And a lot of the empirical work has shown that some of the arguments that Chomsky made through the years, which were theoreticals in saying, these structures do not show up in the input of children. Well, it turns out that a lot of people like Pullum and Schultz have shown these things do appear in the input that kids get. And if we look at more closely at the input that caretakers, parents, and and siblings and so on provide that it's cued to what the kids need with respect to what's sometimes called motherese, um, you know, a special intonation that goes up, um, shorter phrases, um, and again, joint attention, pointing, directing, all those kind of things. And if you look at the ecological environment of language acquisition where all of this happens, then it becomes clear that language is embedded in that and that language is sort of facilitated by that. And it's not the case that we need to postulate a very abstract universal grammar that's part of your genes and that kicks in, you know, sort of almost regardless of input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you're mentioning already a couple of uh, key words that are central to the second chapter of your book, uh, which is called uh, usage-based construction grammar. So uh, domain general cognitive and socio-cognitive processes play a key role there. Um, in, in your view, um, can you maybe outline in a few words what makes a usage-based view of language different from other approaches that are out there? Yeah, I mean, most other approaches sort of look at the structure of language and do not worry about how often a specific um, word is being said. You know, um, you just assume that something like um, um, Zoom meeting, you know, is a lexical concept and you need to store it and it doesn't matter how often you hear it, it's in your mental lexicon. Now, from a usage-based perspective, we would argue that um, it also matters how often you hear and produce something. And as we've all known throughout the pandemic, you know, um, video calls have gone up and many of us had to do uh, remote teaching. So things like home office and Zoom meetings and video calls um, will have been repeated over and over again. And we know from psycholinguistic studies that this has an impact, that we as humans sort of unconsciously register how often we use something and that the variety with which we hear an input, that the different types that are used um, um, with certain structures like um, you give someone a book, you send someone something, um, you WhatsApp me, the dates for our video call, that all of these share a similarity with respect to a transfer, you know, someone transferring something to someone, so the basic notion of the diatransitive, um, but that the instances that are used with that, um, for example, in language acquisition, to go back to that, that parents will very often use give as a prototypical verb for that, and that almost works like an anchor, but there is still type variation. So if you look at the input, you will see there are many different verbs that are used with this transfer semantics, um, but that there is one that maybe dominates or sort of helps as an anchor. And this is then again reflected in the language use of the children. And so a usage-based perspective would really look at how often is a word or a pattern uh, repeated and how does this impact our mental lexicon or the construction and the repository of constructions that we have. Uh -huh. All right. Um, now, um, the, the, the central chapters of the book, uh, chapters three, four and five, uh, they cover constructions at different uh, structural levels of language. So morphology and then phrasal constructions and complex clauses. So in a way, things build up from simpler elements and get more complex. And uh, morphology and syntax uh, seem to play a very special role uh, in construction grammar. Um, and um, if we contrast that with issues that are related to, let's say, semantics or phonology, uh, they don't have their own chapters in the book, but rather they're 
directly woven into the other topics. Um, is there is there a reason that the book has that kind of structure? So it's different from, let's say, an intro course where you uh, start with the sounds and then you uh, cover meaning and then you move on to the other uh, structural layers. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, well, on the one hand, construction grammar evolved as a syntactic theory. So mm -hmm. um, sort of there are definitely sort of historical reasons for having chapters on morphology and, and more syntactic, uh, syntactically inclined phenomena. But also what we in construction grammar, I think, subscribe to is the idea that form and meaning together form a construction. And that's why semantics in the classic sense, but also including pragmatic information, when to say something, to whom to talk in a certain way, and so on, forms an integral part of this usage packet of the constructs that we get um, and that we extract. And of course, all of the constructions that we um, go through in the book, be it morphological ones, um, from word formation up to abstract clausal patterns, they all have a meaning side to that. And that's sort of important, that we don't think that meaning is something that is just an epiphenomenon, but it's always part of a constructional description. And that brings us back again to what we humans do is symbolic interaction. So any kind of formal output will be tied to some kind of semantic meaning, um, because that's how we interact. Um, at the same time, and that's, that was important for me, um, one of the major points of criticism of the handbook uh, that Graham and I edited, whereby um, my good friend and colleague Hans Boas, who pointed out that frame semantics, something that is um, the description of how humans um, store specific scenes in an encyclopedic fashion that we know sort of all of the participants that are entailed in let's say traveling, you know, that you go to an airport, you know, there's security checks, you get your ticket, maybe you've got an online ticket, and then you're bored and that kind of thing. Um, but this also evolves in a usage-based fashion that we've got these um, semantic frames um, that help us navigate our world. And these are obviously closely related to the linguistic items and the, the constructions, and that's, we owe a huge debt to Chuck Fillmore, um, who pointed this out, and who's one of the founding father, if fathers, if not the founding father of construction grammar. Um, but in many of the things I'd done before and in the handbook, you know, frame semantics was sort of not really, uh, didn't get the credit it deserved. And that's why for this book, I really tried with all of the constructions to bring it in. I don't think that frame semantics is the, the sole basis of constructional meaning, as I say in the book, and work from embodiment, you know, um, that we as humans have bodies and interact with the world, um, going back to works by Lakoff and Johnson. Uh, which forms the basis for many of our metaphors that you're in love, out of love, um, where you conceive of an abstract um, notion like love in terms of containment. You almost feel like you're either in that room of love or you're outside of it. Um, that forms an, an integral part of our conceptual thinking. Um, but frame semantics definitely is a very important one. And all of these things, the embodied notion, um, as well as um, frame semantics that's tied to specific constructions and their use. And that's why there isn't a separate chapter on semantics, but even, you know, through all of the, the chapters, there's going to be something on semantics. Um, and it's because it's so tightly woven into what a construction is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so if I turn to uh, yet another chapter that I really enjoyed, uh, it's the one on variation and change. Um, which, as you point out, has uh, a central status, in fact, in, in usage-based construction grammar. Um, so um, is there anything that uh, you would have added still to that chapter if you had had more space, uh, more pages to fill in the book? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the parts on pigeons and creels um, is very short, also because there isn't an awful lot of work on this. Um, Alex Burks and I are currently um, editing a new series, um, which I shamelessly sort of promote here, uh, Elements in Construction Grammar. Um, and we're also currently sort of um, contacting experts in the field of pigeon and creole studies, because we think construction grammar brings a lot to the table and mm. is actually a, a fairly convincible um, tool for describing how pigeonization and creolization is the um, 
the birth of new um, languages, so to speak, in situations where two people meet that don't have a common language or even an international lingua franca to draw on, and then they sort of have to um, create um, a language system on the fly, off the cuff. Um, and we can see how cognitive processes play a huge role there. Um, but as I said, there's only limited um, pieces of construction work on that. And that, I think, is a field that's definitely um, needs more attention because it will be fascinating. And I would have loved to do more on that um, because um, that's definitely something where I think there's too little in the book. Um, but then again, there's always um, the um, notion of pages and publishers pointing out that you're going overboard with things, um, as we all know. But pigeons and creels, that's something that I would have loved to talk about. Um, there is a lot about, I would also argue, with the new Englishes and new um, digital media that would probably be very interesting to take a much closer look. So um, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and so on, where language use is even more connected, but at the same time, you can use certain features to be indexical about where you come from. Um, so that would be something that would be worth including, I think. Um, and then in any case, you know, with the post-colonial varieties, so varieties of English which have evolved after places like Kenya or South Africa or Australia were no longer colonies but became independent countries. Um, the English language there obviously is part of an ecology of different languages and all of these native languages as well as Englishes sort of perform certain functions for different people and it's again a complex ecology um, and much more work could be done on that and much more could have been said about that. Um, I could have also, if I had more space, talked a bit about Stefan Huda's Dyer construction grammar um, and the predictions that he makes. That would definitely be something that I would like to include like in a, in a future edition, should there ever be one. Um, so in the book, you get a very short glimpse, really, at what the varieties of Englishes around the world look like. And, mm -hmm. and I'm making no claims as to having an exhaustive kind of narrative for all of it. Um, but I think I've just given a couple of pointers to, well, where could we go beyond that? And there's so much more to be said about these new Englishes and Englishes around the world anyway, from a construction grammar perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, that's really interesting. So you're saying that in the community of researchers doing work on pigeons and creoles, uh, construction grammar is something that is uh, interesting and, and, and valuable to them. So um, I know that, for example, in uh, the area of, let's say, grammaticalization studies, uh, construction grammar has had an enormous success and, and people have flocked to it. And uh, then there are maybe other areas where uh, people are aware of construction grammar, but it isn't seen as, let's say, that essential or, or, or necessary to adopt. But you seem to be saying that in, in pigeons and creoles, there's sort of a dynamic, a, a momentum that's, uh, that's going on. Is that so? I would hope so. I mean, when, we, when uh -huh. we checked out the list of potential authors, we came across a handful of people. Um, and I think so... Um, there is an emerging field, and if anyone's watching this, you know, if you're interested in it, I'm pretty sure there's lots of research questions that you could follow up on. Um, but unlike grammaticalization, where, as you said, you know, lots of people are now using mm. construction grammar as a theory, I don't think that in, in language contact, and in particular in pidgin and creole studies, um, a lot has been done um, on um, construction grammar approaches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to come to something uh, completely different um, <clears throat> uh, that relates to uh, chapter seven of the book, uh, where you contrast uh, different constructional approaches. So uh, there are lots of them out there. So there's cognitive construction grammar, uh, which is usually associated with, uh, let's say, the work of Adele Goldberg. Uh, there's radical construction grammar. Um, again, uh, associated with the work by uh, Bill Croft, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems that there are lots of different uh, versions of construction grammar that uh, differ uh, across various dimensions and, and aspects. So um, if I come to construction grammar as a newcomer, as a student, um, does it mean that I have to choose one uh, over the others? Uh, 
could it be that I'm picking the wrong one for me? Or uh, how does this work? Um, why are there so many construction grammars? Yeah, um, well, I would reassure people that, you know, as long as you're doing construction grammar, you're doing it right. <laughs> Um, but um, more seriously, um, th the different approaches differ in, in important aspects. But, um, and that's going back to Adele Goldberg's contribution to the handbook, which is just labeled constructionist approaches. And I think that just shows they share a lot of the common tenets, you know, symbolic thinking, constructions as full meaning pairings, um, that all of these things sort of form the, the core belief and assumptions of construction grammar. Now, some of them obviously have a different scope. So radical construction grammar, um, which is being developed by Bill Croft in particular, has a typological background. So he's really interested. And he's got a new book coming out in the RET series as well. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, about the morphosyntax of the world languages. Um, right. Absolutely fascinating because Bill is the world leading authority uh, on construction grammar and typology uh, and a brilliant scholar. Um, um, but there, of course, the, 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 the focus is on how different um, languages might encode similar meanings, how semantic maps that we have of certain things flesh out uh, in different languages. Um, at the same time, because of this typological angle, some of it might be more abstract. Um, also, strangely enough, and that's more of an aside, and, and again like an ad for another book by Bill Croft, um, I thought his, I think it's a 2012 book, Verbs, uh, where he talks about aspects, argument structure, and tense constructions. Um, that hasn't been sort of um, been picked up enough, I would think. I don't see a lot of people referencing it. I think it's got a lot of important insight. Um, so strangely enough, some people are sort of missing out on the book. And if you haven't read it, again, I strongly endorse that. It's a great book. Um, but because of this typological angle, again, some things are going to be more abstract. Um, and also, I mean, um, Bill explicitly is against formalization. I think you can explain this historically, what within the states, because the one formal paradigm that was important, um, or still is, is Chomsky and linguistics. And it's almost like a um, sort of move away from this and its claims. Um, but then again, you've got more formal approaches to construction grammar, which explains why at the other end, you've got people who are sort of, I think, closer to computational science, um, like um, the fluid construction grammar people. Um, they're doing some great work with respect to also the passing of um, authentic language into the constructions that are used. So they're more interested in a computational application. Um, but that also makes it sound as if it's way too limited. They also include work from embodied research, um, just like embodied construction grammar. They're also more processing based, and you can see the advantages of that. If Again, you don't have to pick one, but if you're more interested in language processing, and also, I guess, in the interface to um, neurosciences and psycholinguistics, then these processing based models, which make explicit claims about how constructions interact and they formalized it, like embodied construction grammar, like fluid construction grammar, or Ray Jackendorf's parallel architecture, then it's easier to sort of link these to that kind of research because they make specific predictions. Mm -hmm. And again, at the same time, you know, um, the work that Adele's been doing um, in what's been known as cognitive construction grammar, and very often it's the construction grammar that people know, um, is the usage-based perspective, lots of work on um, diachronic construction grammar and social variation um, use that framework and the the advantages that it's not too formalized so it's like a, a good entry point for people um, and as I said it has given us a lot of great insight into many phenomena um, off the top of my head a bit of a, a, a pet um, topic of mine if we think about filler gap constructions Thing, something that was really at the heart of generative grammar, where they said, well, if you look at uh, questions like who did you talk to and relative clauses, the man to who I talked or who I talked to, you see similarities because you can say, um, who did Tom say that Martin claimed that Adele talked to? Some of these are really contrived and you don't find them in usage and the longer they get, the more complicated they get. But at least you can, you can make them a bit longer and you can do this for questions and relative clauses. And so they share something, these 
different kind of construction share something. And um, generative grammar was really good at capturing generalizations. Um, and that's, I think, again, something to be, um, that should interest us as construction grammarians. Um, but Adele, for example, um, in collaboration with others, has shown that um, pragmatic information and information structure crucially also informs what you can do and what you cannot do with these constructions, what you can question and what you can't question. Um, right. And Ivan Sark has a brilliant paper in language, it's a bit of a tough read, um, where, um, I think it was 2010, um, where he looks at these different filler gap constructions as, yeah, they have a lot in common, but if you look more closely, then there's lots of idiosyncrasies. Um, mm. So what, for example, is only used in standard English in interrogatives, but it's not used in relative clauses. Um, so that's a dialect feature. Um, the book what I read. Um, so there are, despite the fact they look all alike, they've got many differences. Um, and so again, Adele has done some great work there um, on this um, argument structure constructions, the, the, the book that she's probably most famous for and her recent book um, explained me this, also went back to this and gave it a psycholinguistic perspective. So bringing it back to the question that you actually asked, because I know I'm rambling a bit. Um, you don't have to choose, um, they all share enough, and that's also, I think, what, what I try to do in the book, is say, you can have a format of constructional description which is explicit enough to translate into all of these, and if you, if you want to work more on fluid construction grammar and the computational implementation, then once you've read the book, you can move on to that, and there's still a learning curve, but you should have got the basics. Um, or if you want to pursue more of Adele kind of works in cognitive construction grammar, then that avenue should be open to you. Um, so I don't know whether that succeeds as a whole in the book, but it was like a path that I tried to pave for people that would allow them then to choose these different aspects of construction grammar, which allow you to pursue different kind of research questions while at the same time still being part of this larger research agenda that is construction grammar. All right. That sounds really interesting. So uh, I'm just going to ask you one final question, perhaps, about the book. Um, and uh, that concerns, well, uh, Thomas as not just someone who writes a book about ideas that are out there in the field, but also as, as a researcher, as someone who's been working with data. Um, so... Throughout the book, um, you discuss the work of researchers such as Adele Goldberg or Chuck Fillmore or Bill Croft, who have been central uh, to the constructional enterprise. And uh, you uh, explain what their ideas are all about. You systematize them. You put them um, in a context. Um, now, what I would like to know is, um, are there points where... Um, you don't find yourself in complete agreement with whatever it is that Adele or, or Chuck or, or Bill have been suggesting. Are there points of view where you would personally have doubts or disagree or take things into a different direction? Are there, are there things like that? I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of, of giants here. So um, I'm incredibly indebted to their work. Um, as I, I guess we all are. And I mean, Chuck more or less founded all of this. Um, so there's really only sort of one um, disagreement I have with, with <laughs> Chuck. Um, and that is more of a, of a, it's not a theoretical thing because of course, when he started out in the 1980s developing construction grammar, it was against this background of generative linguistics. So he went for a formal model and he and Paul Kay developed like an alternative view of grammar that then started construction grammar. Um, but what they didn't do, and that's a, it's, it was a real problem for the community, I think, they'd written like an entire course book um, on construction grammar. Um, and there's a 1993 version and a 1995 version. And it's almost like um, some uh, kind of um, hidden scripture, you know, that was passed along uh, between researchers. And if you could get your hands on it, you would get copies to everyone who, who was there. Um, but they never published it. And um, I remember in, 
Shortly after the handbook, I contacted, contacted Paul and Chuck and asked them whether they wanted to just publish it in Constructions, the open online um, journal that um, Stefan Hartmann and Lotte Zomra are now editing, because mm. I thought it was an important historical text that, of course, many of the analyses weren't quite up to date anymore, right? But, I mean, that wasn't the point. The point was to have this full textbook um, by Chuck and Paul, and they were really hesitant, because at one point, I think they had promised it to some kind of publishers and then never materialized. There were sort of these kind of issues that I think the publishers wouldn't have a problem with, but um, Paul and Chuck sort of felt indebted to the publishers or whatever. And I thought that was a real loss because it could have really moved um, the theory as a whole uh, forward considerably. Um, and then because of that, I also think it wasn't possible to sort of... Um, Push the agenda to the to the um, way that would have been possible, um, because of course Paul and, and Chuck were not usage based in their approach. It was like a very formal um, abstract representation, um, and it would have been good to bring together um, the work in frame semantics um, that Chuck had done much earlier and much more deeply into what's now known as Berkeley construction grammar, the construction grammar type that. Um, Chuck and, and Paul then developed. I think it's fair to say that for Chuck it was more about frame semantics then and frame net and he sort of focused more on that. Um, but it would have been good to bring these together earlier. And also the fact, um, not a name that you mentioned, but I mean someone that I'm, I'm, I'm also a great admirer of, Ivan Sark, you know, has also brought the theory uh, forward considerably um, by developing constructionist um, instances of head-driven phrase structure grammar and sign-based construction grammar, uh, very formal approaches. But again, they're not usage-based. And I don't really see any, any efforts to bring usage-based information, which we know is important because we've seen it in language acquisition, we see it in language variation and change. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not easy to incorporate that in a theory. And historically, it makes sense because it developed as something completely different. It was a competence model and, again, you know, almost computational in scope that wasn't interested in actual language processing, but more in a declarative repository of what kind of constructions are there to explain all of the output of speakers in a more abstract sense. But from a usage-based perspective, our focus is more on the individual and what they're exposed to. And so... For these formal models, it will be important to incorporate usage-based information and sort of brings us back to the question which, which type of construction grammar should you choose. As I said, they're all uh, interesting and, and offer different points of views. Um, but the one theory, if I were to single out one, um, that I find really interesting is fluid construction grammar because they take into account usage-based information. They want to bring this to a computational model and... Um, so if I would have to bet like uh, five euros on, a, on any theory that could really sort of um, move us uh, forward in the future, then it would be fluid construction grammar. All right. Well, Thomas, uh, thank you so much for all of these answers. Um, the book is going to be out uh, later this month or in July. Is that right? Something like that. Uh, publishers uh, seem to be um, changing the dates, but it should be out now or soon. Okay, well, that's great news. Uh, congratulations again. And, um, well, you sort of have promised uh, a second edition at some point. So I'm already looking forward to that. And I hope that uh, when that one rolls around, we'll have another chance to uh, sit down and talk about it. Uh, and, of course, hopefully before that, uh, in the real world, uh, preferably uh, with a few beers. Absolutely. Right. It's been too long. <laughs>